Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Eric Carlen from uh, Rutgers University. And um, the titles of today's presentation is Cuts Master Equations, Classical and Quantum. So as usual, let me say that uh, the seminar will be recorded and uh, put on YouTube. And um, if you have any question, please write them in the chat or you can uh, unmute yourself. And uh, I now leave the floor to Eric. Uh, please, we are looking forward to your presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much, Marcello. Yeah, let me update one uh, thing, minding the talk and um, minding the chat doesn't work so well. So if you have a question, don't please don't type it into the chat. Um, just unmute yourself and, and ask it directly, please. And so um, this is a slightly different. I had planned to talk about a, a range of recent work, including some work I've been doing with Bernd Wenberg in uh, Chalmers in Sweden on another kind of a CATS model with exclusion built in, but it came out to be too many, way too many sites. So I'm going to just restrict to uh, these topics, some recent progress in classical CATS master equations, and then talk about some results on quantum. So, so the papers that are involved are all on the archive. And there's a recent paper by, um, with myself and Maria Carvalho and Michael Loss that uh, just came out in Annals of Probability and that has some of the latest work on the class classical model. And then there's a paper on, by the same authors on the archive and this has just appeared in Advances in Math and this is on the, the quantum cats model. Okay, now, okay. We're to ask case is, oh, thanks place in a probability space, and we're going to be studying Markovian semigroups. And the Markovian operator is one that preserves the constant function on the probability space, and it preserves positivity. And in addition, it preserves a certain measure. Now, since um, the constant function is preserved, one is an eigenvalue. And so in the dual, there's also a, a measure that is preserved, and we're just assuming that is the measure. Okay, so um, the semigroup is ergodic. If the only function that's preserved are the constants, and semigroup is reversible in case each of these um, operators, m of t, is, is self-adjoint. And in, in that case, the spectrum lies in zero and one, and this semigroup is a contraction on, on all LP. Okay, um, now, we're, we're interested in these things that they often model an approach to equilibrium. That's one of the ways they rise in mathematical physics. And so let nu be another probability measure on X and suppose it's absolutely continuous and write it with some density. Okay, so, so then, well, then we, we, the, the way one defines this action on the semigroup without even assuming it's absolutely continuous is you just use the duality. So you push the, you, you let the semigroup operate in the test functions. And if it's ergodic, then you can see from the fact that the, this M of T is gonna to converge to its, its integral. And that means that the action of the semigroup takes this measure nu on to mu. So you think of mu as the equilibrium measure and we want to know how, we get there, okay? So we want to quantify this rate of convergence. We'll do it in this absolutely continuous case. And so one readily checks that if it is absolutely continuous, you just apply it in this reversible case that the semigroup just gets applied to, to F here. Okay, now there are two kinds of things we're gonna be looking at. And Okay, well, so yeah, so there's the semigroup is the derivative. And then one way to look at the thing is the, is the spectral gap. So you look at, I mean, it's a contracted, Semigroup is a contraction semigroup, so the generator is negative. So you look at minus and take the um, infimum of the expectation values being orthogonal to the zero mode, the ground state. And then it's a simple exercise to show that under the semigroup, you approach the limit, the expected value at an exponential rate, provided this lambda is greater than zero. So that's one of the things that one can try to compute. And the other one that's of interest in the setting is involving the relative entropy, okay? So the thing that's on the right in here looks like maybe an entropy to you, except it's missing the minus sign, but that's because it's really a relative entropy and the usual sign convention there is to do it so that the, rel the relative entropy is convex as opposed to entropy, which is concave, hence the H and, and not the S. Okay, so it's equal to this in terms of the rata nicotine derivative as there is one and it's infinite otherwise. So we'll be interested in this case. Now this isn't a metric or anything, but it, it controls the distance between two things. So the well-known um, Pinsker inequality says that the relative entropy between mu and nu is, is given by the L1 distance squared of, between F and the identity, or what's the same thing? It's saying it's one half the square of the total variation distance between mu and nu. 
Okay, so if you show that this quantity is decreasing, you're studying convergence in the L1 norm. Good, okay. Now, by the convexity of T log T, this relative entropy is decreasing along the flow, and that's just because the Markov semigroup is, is an averaging operation. So define the entropy dissipation to be the negative of the time derivative, that will make it positive, right, of this quantity, which you easily work out to be just this. I mean, when you differentiate the logarithm, it, it goes away because you get a one over F, which cancels the F, and then you integrate by parts. Okay, so the entropy dissipation constant is the ratio of this entropy dissipation to the entropy, and then you take the infimum over all probability densities. Okay, so that is that. Now, if this gamma of f is, is greater than zero, then the relative entropy decreases at an exponential rate, and hence the L1 norm is decreasing at the exponential rate. Good. Okay, now what we're interested in here. Here are families of not a single Markov semigroup, but families. And these will be describing stochastic evolutions of a system of n particles. And what we're interested in is when we can bound the rate of convergence to equilibrium in one way or another, um, uniformly in n. Okay, there are other ways of interest involving transport metrics, but I'll, we'll be talking only about these two. Okay, now there's one example that's going to come up in proofs of some things that will follow that's, that's important to understand and it's probably familiar. When it is. So the prototypical example considers the sphere of radius square root of n in n-dimensional Euclidean space. And then you can think of an element V1 through Vn of this as representing the set of velocities of n one-dimensional particles. And they have total energy one and Right? I mean, I have total energy n, but that since they're n particles, that means you've got unit energy per particle, right? Okay. So you can think of this state space, this sphere, as sort of the microcanonical ensemble of a bunch of non interacting one dimensional particles. Now, let's evolve measures on this under the heat semigroup. Okay. So the spectral gap on the Laplacian of a sphere of radius r is n minus one over r squared. This is just easy, easy to work out because the eigenfunctions are spherical harmonics. And so you, know, you can just com compute it. And um, for the unit sphere, it's well known it's n minus one. And then it, because we're scaling it, you get this r over here. And so the spectral gap for n particles is n minus one over n. And so in D, from uh, uniform, Okay. Now, if you look at entropy, it's a little interesting. Uh, if you compute the derivative patient, this is a quantity that came up, invented by a statistician, R.A. Fisher. This is the so-called Fisher information. Okay, And if you differentiate the Fisher information again, then you find that it decreases at this rate. You, again, you see this n minus 1 over R squared. And this is a calculation due to Bakri and Emery, um, the way it, it you just, you, it's really a calculation. You just have to do it carefully. You see that when you've got the gradient showing up there, that's a vector. When you differentiate again, you end up commuting the Laplacian with a gradient. And this brings in the Ricci curvature through the bachner wietzenbach formula. And this is exactly where this n minus one over r squared comes from. So, okay. so you do a calculation and you find that that's happening. Then this is the bakri emery approach. You, you integrate, the, the, you've got this decreasing in the exponential rate. You integrate it back up, remembering that the entropy is the derivative of the Fisher information anyway, and you get this constant, which relates the H to the I, which was the dissipation. And you get that the, something very similar, you get that this entropy dissipation constant is, is, is given is at least two times N minus one over N. So that's very similar to what we saw for the spectral gap, and that's not a mistake. So, this is an argument due to a guy, Rothaus, a, a student of Len Gross. If you take the density F, which is close to equilibrium, so it's the constant one plus epsilon times H, and H has to integrate to zero because it's a F is a probability density, and you just expand leading order. So this entropy dissipation works out to be minus epsilon squared times, times H, okay? And then if you expand out the... Um, the relative entropy doing the Taylor series, you get a second order term twice as one of them comes with. So this, anyway, so this shows that this, this 
energy dissip entropy dissipation constant is exactly this 2n over n minus 1, because otherwise you'd get a better result than the spectral gap. And OK, so this is what, so this in this case, we have both entropy and we have the spectral gap. Okay. Now we're also interested in the marginal densities for families of such processes. So take let this function g v of t denote the first marginal of the evolution of f along the heat flow. Okay. okay. Now simple calculations then show that the way this evolves is given by this expression here in the middle of the page. And as n goes to infinity, this will simplify to be this generator of the Mailer semigroup. Okay, so in the limit as n goes to infinity, what you get is the evolution according to the Mailer semigroup. And by the way, you can take the marginal before or after because taking the marginal just means you average over all rotations that fix the first axis and rotations commute with the Laplacian. So you can take it before or after. Okay, so uh, this equation, the Mailer semigroup, was actually derived in this exact same way in 1866 by Mailer, who was studying completeness of spherical harmonics, with the difference that he used the Poisson semigroup in place of the heat semigroup. Okay, now exactly what we're interested in here is, is the equations for the evolution of these single particle marginals, but under, under different sorts of evolutions. If you just take the heat flow on the sphere, and look at the evolution of the marginal, you get another linear equation. Now you can deduce that the solutions of this Mailer semigroup are approaching the Gaussian equilibrium um, at an exponential rate in the entropic sense using the entropy production on the sphere. That would be a kind of extravagant way to do that because this is a linear equation and you can analyze that directly using Gross's logarithmic Sobolev inequality. Okay, um, But in other cases, it's not so clear. And now I turn to what we're really going to be interested in. So there's a process interest introduced by Mark Katz, also takes place on the sphere. And I'm going to just talk with the simple formulas here about the one which has one dimensional velocities and will conserve energy and not momentum. Now, everything that you can prove about this for the one dimensional system, you can prove after more effort has been done now for actual three dimensional velocities with momentum conserving collisions, so-called real billiard ball type collisions. Okay, um, the interest of this, the reason Marquette wrote this down is if you do this the, in this way, since the collision mechanism is binary, the evolution of the single particle marginal depends on the two particle marginal. Okay, now you break the hierarchy if, you, if the two particle marginal is a product of the one particle marginals, and then you get a nonlinear with a quadratic nonlinearity, a nonlinear evolution equation for the first particle marginal. And that's a sort of model Boltzmann equation called the Katz-Boltzmann equation in one dimension. If you do the same thing with the three-dimensional uh, velocities and real momentum conserving collisions, you get the exact um, real uh, spatially homogeneous Boltzmann equation for hard sphere collisions, okay? Okay, out in the same way. So that's the evolution of the marginals. It's that equation. Now, in this, un, unlike what we just saw for the heat equation, this time it's a nonlinear equation. Lots of evolution of quickly the Boltzmann equation equilibriates for hard sphere collisions. Okay, so Katz's, Katz's approach was let's introduce this stochastic process and let's see if we can understand what's going on for the n particle system, which is governed by this linear evolution equation, this Katz master equation, and use that to obtain information on how this nonlinear equation, this Boltzmann equation is, is evolving. Can you, can you do that? And after much work, the, the answer is, is yes. Although of course, a lot of work has been done on the Boltzmann equation in the meantime. So the state of the art of sort of direct analysis of the Boltzmann equation has advanced quite a bit. Okay, so anyway, here's what we'll do. We take this thing and we're gonna have binary collisions and we're gonna conserve the energy. And this is pretty much what they have to be. You pick a pair of particles, I and J, and you have to keep the sum of the squares the same. So you rotate them. So in the IJ plane, you rotate the particles. So you pick a random rotation, okay? So what we're gonna do is pick a pair uniformly at random. So they're N choose two pairs. So you do these things with N choose two and then you have the particles collide. Now, if in the original Katz model, this gamma that you see here in the rates was just zero. So what Katz did was you, you have all these Poisson clocks running, okay? And they're running with a rate which goes effectively like one over N. And so 
you, you, you run them all, all, all at the, the same rate, okay? So one goes off, it's, uh, they're all at random, you pick a pair at random, it's effectively that, and then you make a jump and the process starts over, okay? Now in the real physical model, then you would have a dependence on this, not all collisions would be happening at the same, same rate, okay? In fact, in the three-dimensional model, you would care about the directions which they're traveling and not just the magnitude of the velocity, but in, you can't, incorporate all of those features into the one-dimensional model. So the thing to do is to have the collisions occur at a rate which depends on some power of this energy. And gamma equals one half is what corresponds to the hard sphere collisions because then the rate is in magnitude proportional to the velocity, okay? So each of these Poisson clocks is running at this rate. And when one of them goes ding, then you pick the ij particles and they, they do a collision and then the process starts over, okay? Okay, so that's, that describes the catch process. Then it's easy to write down the generator for it, and this is what the generator is, and this is the effect of having taken this F superscript ij. You just average in the ij's plane over all these rotations, and that gives you this thing. So, so here's the generator. So it's, it, it, it's built out of rotations, okay? And so it's a a fairly simple object. When gamma is equal to zero, it's really just built out of rotations. And then it commutes with the Laplacian. And so you know that the eigenfunctions are going to be spherical harmonics. And that may sound, okay, now that case should be really easy. We should be able to just say what the eigenvalues are in the spectral gap. But it's not, and it's not clear which spherical harmonic gives you the gap right away, right, right? Okay. When gamma is not equal to zero, that's not true. It, it doesn't commute with the Laplacian anymore. Okay, so once again, we're also be interested in the entropy. And so the HN is this, and um, right, and again we have the Pinsker inequality. So if we if we know that if we prove an entropy dissipation inequality, then we would have exponential convergence. Okay, so here's what this is: you differentiate this along this flow of the entropy, and when you do that, you get this expression, which is not so nice to look at, but but here it is. You can write it down. So this psi is this traditional. Uh, thing that shows up in the Boltzmann equation, okay? And so it's a nice positive function, and this is it. Okay, now, a breakthrough is, and this was problem was made by Villani in 2003, and he modified the model a bit. So he replaced the rates which we have with these other rates which have the additional factor of one stuck in. So this makes them bounded below. And Later, what he showed was that the entropy dissipation constant is bounded below by something depending only on gamma times the entropy, but divided by n to the one minus gamma. So when gamma is one, then you're in good shape. You have a proper entropy dissipation bound, at least when you've got this extra uh, help in there. When n is, when gamma is one half, that's the case we're actually interested in. That's hard sphere collisions. They're probably the main physical case. Then then you don't, there's this n to the one half in there and the entropy production constant goes to zero with the number of particles like n to the one half, which means you don't get any rate at all from this that you can pass along to study the corresponding Boltzmann equation, okay? So uh, Villani conjectured that this n to the one minus gamma was sharp and this was proved by Amit Ainav, who was a student of Michael Loss and as, as uh, Villani had con conjectured. Okay, so somehow when you, when you speed up the rate at which particles with high energy collides, one gets a better entropy uh, dissipation inequality. But does one really need the extra one? So if you, if you go back to the rates that we have, the ones that, are, that have the, the scaling that's there in the physically interesting models, I mean, adding the plus one breaks the scaling. If you do that, then no entropy production inequality is known except for, for gamma equals to zero. And, but of course, then, then adding the one or not doesn't matter because you've already got a one, okay? So, you know, can, can, so one problem is, can one get rid of this one? Is, is there entropy production if you take these, these rates with proper scaling and none, none of the proofs exist to do that, okay? Now there's another approach to doing the gamma equals zero besides Villani's. I'll explain a little later how Villani's proof works because we'll use the argument again. And this one also yields for the gamma equals zero case, the constant going like one over n. In fact, it, it yields what looks on the face like this 
the bare constant and the one Villani obtains specialize his argument on for all gamma, two gamma equals zero, you get the same constant, okay? So, the, but it's an entirely different argument. And this depends on an inequality that was proved by myself and Elliot and, and Michael Oss. And this gives a sharp inequality ex expressing the subadditivity of the entropy for the sphere, okay? So for any probability density F on the sphere, let PKF denote its case marginal, right? So you just average over all rotations leaving the kth axis fixed. And then what you find is that the sum of the entropies of these marginals is less than twice the entropy of the whole thing. And the constant two is sharp. Now, if we replace this uniform measure on the sphere of radius square root of n with the, unit, with the Gaussian measure, the standardized Gaussian measure, you would instead have the usual subadditivity expression for Gauss measure. And that's because the coordinate functions are exactly independent. So this is very simple, the usual proof of, of subadditivity. Okay, it looks like superadditivity here because we're talking about relative entropy, so we've changed the, the sign convention. Okay, but it's just because it's relative entropy. Okay, now the, the function two is sharp on the sphere, and the known functions that show that the two is sharp have almost all of their mass concentrated near points where one of the velocities is square root of n in magnitude, plus or minus that I should say. Okay, I'm, so you have to put all the energy into one particle. These are things you're not going to wander into when you're doing the evolution. Okay, um, so are they relevant? Well, now let's Let's do the following, the same thing we did before. Take, let's take this entropy inequality and stuff into it. Okay, let's take this entropy inequality and, and stuff into it the one plus epsilon h where h integrates to zero. And now you do the same expansion, okay, and that we did earlier. And what you deduce from this is that the inner product of the bracket of, of pk with h is less than twice h, which gives you an upper bound on this. Okay, so introduce this operator p, which is the average of these projections. And you learn that the, as long as you're orthogonal to the constants, the biggest expectation value you can get, so this would be the next largest eigenvalue, is two over n. Okay, now the spectrum of p was computed exactly by myself, uh, Maria Cavallo and Michael Loss in our first work on the CATS model. And, and here's the exact answer. So it's one over n plus something which goes like over n squared. So there's this strange thing going on that comes up again and again in this. If you linearize an entropy inequality, you get a spectral gap inequality, but often not as good as the sharp one because the entropy inequality, entropy inequality is somehow more sensitive to residual dependencies among the particles for large n, okay? And I think this, this puts the spot in what is a big open problem that's really not understood in all these examples yet, or at least I don't understand. And that's why this thing is in italics. Um, as I said, this two is what you get in the entropy and equal functions. You get all the mass concentrated where all the energy is in one particle. That's totally irrelevant to the cat's dynamics. No sequence of collisions is going to ever get you there from any reasonable state. So it must be that if you have some reasonable quantity, say, for instance, a bound on the variance of the energy, right, that, that, that the variance of the energy is growing like n, it must be the case that then you get a good constant like one over n instead of two over n for this kind of thing, and then you would get good entropy production, okay? But no one knows how to prove that, unfortunately. So this is, but see, this, there's something different that happens here with this cat's dynamics and what's going on with the sphere. With the sphere, every, every with the sphere, there's no difference. If you, if you work with in things that are not jump processes, if you linearize the entropy production inequality, you get the exact spectral gap inequality, right? That's what happens on the sphere. That's not what happens in these things. Okay, so now what I would like to do is what's new with these things. You take this generator, which we've introduced, and you look at the next lowest eigenvalue for things that are proportional or orthogonal to the constants, the constant function. Okay, the constant function being the, the, the ground state. Okay, and, and the theorem is that for all gamma, the spectral gap is bounded away from zero by a strictly computable constant. And okay, so this is what it is. And it says here, uh, we, this is 2014 and 2020. So in 2014, this was done exactly for this one dimensional model. And we did it paying close attention to the numbers. So we did it only there for symmetric functions that we said we could do it for, for, for everything. Um, and because for symmetric functions, we could get good numbers out. So you can actually get a, an, 
quantity, a number, a numerical bound for the spectral gap for this linearized Katz Boltzmann equation uh, doing this. Okay, now Boltzmann equation sphere until uh, very recently, it's work of Clump, they proved a quantitative estimate on the spectral gap for the Boltzmann equation with hard sphere collisions. And until that was done, yeah. Not yeah. Okay. So the, the method we described there, we wanted to get good numbers out. And so, so actually, you, you actually can compute stuff there and you get quite, quite, good, quite good numbers by this method. It's, it's actually, the constant is computable in that paper, we computed them. We, to simplify the computation, we just dealt with the symmetric sector, which is all that's relevant for the Boltzmann equation. Okay. So though we set our method, we'd do it too. Um, Sasada introduced another method for dealing with a related, a cl very closely related model. And so she did that in a hydrodynamic problem and they needed the spectral gap in the anti-symmetric sector. And so they, they couldn't, so, so there's, a, there's a, an, another approach, but this, this one actually does work. Our original approach did work for the symmetric sector and it is adaptable not only to the simple one-dimensional thing, but to the three-dimensional. So the 2020 paper is the paper, which is uh, now in Annals of Probability. And it um, deals, it shows, carries through the same results for this full, the, the real hard sphere collisions in three dimensions. Okay. And it does it for the symmetric and anti-symmetric, which we probably would have, should have done in the, in the first paper too, but okay, there it is. Okay. So I want to, yeah, say, Okay, a little bit about it. I mean, the, the case gamma equals zero is done much easier. That's that's really simple. As we've said before, when you take gamma equals zero, the generator commutes with the commutes with the Laplacian. So the eigenfunctions are going to be spherical harmonics. So they're going to be polynomials, and you could easily guess that it's going to be a, the, an eigenfunction will be a low low dimensional uh, polynomial, a low, low degree polynomial. And you try the few things out, and you you find what the best choice seems to be is, is this particular guy. It has this structure, it's a sum of functions of a single variable. This is what the function is. And you get this eigenvalue, which is one half n plus two over n minus one. So the eigenvalues decrease, but they decrease to one half. Okay, and then the object is to prove that this is exactly right, and, and this is true. So this was done by myself and Carvalho and Loss in 2001, and this was just shortly after Elise jean -Vresse proved that the original Katz conjecture was that this limb inf was bigger than zero, although it, it, her method didn't give a, a, an estimate for this, okay? So I want to say a little bit about the method of proof because there's a method here that applies to other um, jump processes with the thing here is that we're not equal to zero, the jump rate is zero from configurations and then these particles don't jump much and one has to, deal with this. And this, this is, it comes up in a number of places and there aren't so many methods. Well, here's the method. Okay. So we introduce a, a conjugate process and the conjugate process is a, a much simpler process at each jump time. Okay. Then you freeze in the case, well, when the case particles clock goes off, you freeze the case particle and all the other particles jump to uniform, keeping that guy fixed on the remaining part of the state space. Okay. Now, th so that's going to be a much simpler thing to analyze. And there's a simple connection between the generator of the original problem and the conjugate problem. So that if you can solve this conjugate problem, the spectral gap problem for it, then you can figure out the spectral gap even exactly for the, for the original Katz process. So this is the first reduction. You go to this conjugate process. Then there are quantitative we call quantitative chaos estimates, but these, these, are, these are estimates which, which quantitatively capture the fact that as you go to high, more and more particles, as n increases, the, coordinate, the, different, the, the different coordinate functions on the sphere become more and more independent, right? So as n goes off to infinity, this you know, uniform measure on the sphere of radius square root of n converges to a Gaussian measure. This is the equivalence of microcanonical and canonical ensembles. And so ex quantitative expressions of how that occurs are, are what we, we use in to make this go, okay? So for example, the, the space script a, a sub n is going to come up. This is the subspace of L2 functions that are sums of functions depending only on a single variable. And we want the F to be orthogonal to the constant. So it's easy to see, you can assume that the each of those phi's must be. Easy, it's 
near coordinate independence, it's if you had exact coordinate independence, it would just be true that L2 of F was going to be equal to the sum of the squares of the L2 norms of these phi's. Okay. Um, now, what, what goes on in here is that actually these constants, so that you have constants above and below bounding it, but they quickly approach one. They approach one like one minus one over n, one plus or minus one over n, depending on which side of the inequality they are. So, so this, this is one of the quantitative expressions that makes this thing work. Okay. And the other thing is the trial function decomposition. So as we saw for gamma, for, for gamma equals zero, the gap eigenfunction is a sum of functions of single variables. It's not like that for the other ones, but it's, it's almost like that for, again, for large n. So you break the trial function up into three pieces. So the H is the part that's orthogonal to such functions, and the S and G is a further decomposition of the part that is the sum of one functions, okay? And each of these pieces has a special structure that makes it good, okay? So, right, okay. Um, yeah, so let me explain now how, how this goes, how this margin, how this thing comes in, this uh, conjugate process. We rewrite this Dirichlet form. This is just the, the inner product of, you know, you go back to, there are too many. Oh yeah, there are, there are too many, right. Yeah, so th this Dirichlet form here is exactly the thing we're looking at in the spectral gap. So it's just often written like this. And we want to introduce a conditional version of it. So this is main, probably the reason for this notation here. Really. So the conditional version of it is you do the same thing, but you fix the case particle. You don't let the case particle collide. So you let all the other guys collide and you only speed up the rate. Well, you're only averaging over the, you, you average over the n minus one particles, choose two that you can pick the pairs of, and then you speed it up n minus this asset. Okay, because then it's, it's easy to see that the interest written as the average, if you average over the choice of k and you integrate with this marginal distribution of the kth velocity, and then this n over n minus one takes into account that before we were just speeding things up for n minus one particles, but now they're n, this is what you get, okay? And now if you just, now we can, now the thing to do is this function f is no longer orthogonal, it slices if you restrict f to some particular value of vk, that slice is not constant, okay? But you can subtract off this constant and that doesn't change anything because you, constants give you zero in the Dirichlet form. And so now it's orthogonal. So you can apply the spectral gap for n minus one particles and you get this. So it's not the F, but it's the F minus, you have to subtract off this PKF. And so what's the end of the sto story? This just simple computation here gives you that this Dirichlet form we're interested in is n over n minus one times the spectral gap for n minus one particles times this form. Okay. Now this is where the conjugate process comes in because this is the quadratic form associated to another process. Okay, so here's the generator for this guy. And this is what I described earlier. You pick for, there are rates associated to each particle. This is what they are in the middle of the page. And so, you know, the only way this rate can be zero is if the case velocity is equal to N. Okay, but that means you've got all the energy in, in the case particle and none of the others have any. So those rates are all gonna be essentially equal to one. Okay, so anyway, so lots of, lots of things are gonna be happening. It can't possibly get stuck. If, if one guy has a low rate, then everyone else has a high rate, okay? So you pick a particle, what happens? That guy gets fixed and then you jump to uniform, okay? Um, that's what the PK does. You're averaging over everything else. And so, um, right, so this is the, the, the play form. That process should be equilibrating rather quickly, one, one would imagine. And yeah, we speed these things up. So let's, 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 so as we said before, you know, at most only one of the particles can have something very small. Most of the time, these VKs are of order one, and then this N minus V over N minus one is, is one. So let's just consider gamma equals zero. Okay, let's also consider what, what would happen if we replace this uniform measure in the sphere with the canonical ensemble, the Gaussian measure, okay? Then these coordinates would all be commuting exactly, okay? And we would have that the spectral gap Okay, these things are just commuting and the spectral gap would just be exactly one over n. Okay, so, so, right. Okay, and yeah, great, good. So here's what we'd like to do. 
Yeah. So now so let's let's so let's introduce this thing with the hat on. It's the same thing. It's, it's the spectral gap. And here's the relation we derived. And um, there's here's the bound that we get is that the for the real catch process, the the spectral gap for n particles is related to the spectral gap for n minus one by this quantity here and the n over n minus one. Okay. And we just argued if you had really had things independent, independent, this thing here, this guy would be of size one minus one over n. So that together would give you something great because this is essentially one, this is one minus, this is one plus one over n. So one plus one over n times one minus one over n is one minus one over n squared. One over n squared is summable. So this infinite product would converge to something non-zero and you would get a lower bound here. Okay. And Okay, and for gamma equals zero, you can do all of this, and this is what you get is the estimate, and we've already seen that there's a function, which an eigenfunction, which gives you that, so that's actually exact. Okay, so now what we'd like to do is to carry this out in, in, in um, well, for the, the other gammas, okay, not gamma equal to zero. And this you to get an entropy help. So let's, for the conjugate process is simple. So you might hope that you can prove that it has a, that the entropy production constant is uniformly bounded below an N and this is true, okay? So if you look at the gamma, you can reduce to the gamma equals one case by using the fact that this rate, unlike the other one, it, it's bounded. So you make this simple reduction. And so if we look at the gamma equals one case, if we can prove entropy production for that, we have an entropy production bound for all the others. Okay, so we only have to look at this super hard sphere case. Okay, um, now I'm going to go through this quick, quickly here, this because otherwise we'll run out of time. But I would just to fly by this. This is how one does all, all of these steps. I'm going to use an argument of Villani. This is essentially the argument Villani used to prove his bound for the real cat's equation. You take this entropy production inequality and you write it um, using. You symmetrize as you do during Boltzmann, and then you, you make a simple Jensen inequality and write and take these averages over rotations inside. And this gives you a quantity called d bar, which is slightly smaller. And you can see it's positive because you know the entropy function, the logarithmic function is monotone. And so that's that's that. Good. Okay. So then you compute the derivative along the Laplacian. And here's the idea. If you run the heat flow, the heat flow is going to take f to the constant function one, and then both of these quantities, then the, then the entropy dissipation goes to zero. So if you integrate it back up, you'll recover the entropy dissipation you started with, okay? So you do a computation and you get two terms. One term you get is, is this thing down here with these gradients in it. And the other term you get is something very much like what you had, except there's a minus Laplacian applied to the rates. Now, a simple computation shows that this is equal to minus two times the rates. So this can be expressed in terms of D itself, which is, So the bound we have is this, okay? We've got this thing before, let me go back up to this. Notice, let's just throw these, we, at least we have an F there, okay? Now, what about this thing? Okay, take N times it, and you can write this now in terms of these, let's see if it comes back. You can write it now in terms of um, the usual angular momentum generators, okay? And now what we do is just throw out the ones that that involve the kth particle, and they, since pk only depends on the kth particle, then you lose that term. Okay, and then you do some simple adding and subtracting using the bounds, and it turns out that this quantity here is bigger than this multiple of this is our friend. Once we integrate it, the Fisher information. Okay, so the long short the story is that this rate of change here's a differential inequality. You bound it below by the Fisher information. Now you integrate it up and you do the right thing using known facts about the Fisher information and you arrive at this entropy production inequality that the dissipation, the D bar, which is lower than the D, is bounded below by this quantity here. Okay, so now let's turn this into a gap inequality. Well, well here's the inequality, right? And Right, so you do the usual thing with the, the, with the gap. Did I put this in here? No, I guess I did. Okay, so you do the expansion. You replace f equals one plus epsilon h, and you get a gap for the thing, and the gap goes down by a factor of two as usual. And so asymptotically, this gives you a lower bound on the gap, which is like one quarter for large n. 
Okay, um, so this does at least show that this gap for the for this process is bigger than zero. But what we wanted to know was that the gap looked very much like one minus one over n. Okay, so this would be no good for the induction. So you do get something from the entropy, but once again, the entropy production bound is much worse than what you would get from the gap. Okay, so here's what the main result is. And simple and squared here. If you look at the current paper in annals where you do the full three complicated, we get an n to the three halves. Okay, but again, this I'm giving the version that's true for everything. Okay, so yeah, so again, here's this space which we already introduced this, this subspace of functions which are functions consisting of a sum of, of single variables. Okay, um, let's look at if you take such a function, we assume that they integrate to zero, and let's stuff such a function into into this Dirichlet form for the process, I mean, what, what happens, okay? Well, if you had the exact independence of the coordinate functions, then PK of phi j would be the integral of phi j, but phi j integrates to zero, so PK of phi j is just gonna be, is just be zero, okay? Well, of course, PK of phi k is, is itself. So if you look at this quantity that shows up, it's F minus this projection, it's exactly the sum over everything but the, Case. The case guy gets canceled out, everything else survives. Okay, so now here's what we've got. That's if you stuff it into the Dirichlet form, you've got this. Now, this depends only in the case particles, this never does. So, independence, this integrates separately. This guy is a constant, you can work out it's one minus a constant over n squared. And now here you are, you're just missing the case thing, but we're summing on k. So, when you average it all, you've got this. Okay. Now this is much better than we were hoping for because you know, we, and this is c over n squared, and we just need something summable at this stage. Okay, so this this is great. Now these were these very special trial functions for a n, but what happens? We have to look at things that are in the orthogonal complement as well, and here things are even better. Okay, and that's because if you're in the orthogonal complement, it's easy to show that p k just drops out to be zero. Okay, so we don't have f minus pk f squared, we just have f squared. And now you use a simple point estimates and you get something which is, which is too good for gamma bigger than zero. Okay? It's one minus fraction over n. Okay, now this is too good to be true because it, remember there's this n over n minus one, which is like one plus one over n. So if you multiply those out, the leading term here is going to still have is still going to be growing, right? Not even decreasing. So you can't have a big component that is in this orthogonal complement space for for the gap function. It can't, it can't look like the gap function has to have a small component in this space. But anyway, for the trial functions, um, this is even better than what we had before. We wanted one minus one over n. This is one minus something smaller over n. Okay, good. So that's what those two get. Now you have to put together these pieces um, because this A sub N is not an invariant subspace, but it's almost an invariant subspace. So you have to control in the Dirichlet form. This is where the N to the three halves come in. Again, you use this almost independence and you control that. So that's, that's what roughly how the whole thing works. Okay, so there's one significant twist and it comes from the first part of the heuristic argument. We use there that you know, the, the, if you have the exact independence, then the sum of the L2 norm squared of the phi's is exactly equal to the L2 norm of the f's, okay? What we can, what's true in this case is that it's bigger than or equal to one minus a constant over n times that, and there's the, and there's the corresponding bound. Now, this would be very problematic going for the leading term. So what you actually have to do is to take this G, it should be a GN of FF, I guess, over here. You subtract off the, con the, the fixed term, the one. So we're trying to show that something goes like one, um, yeah, one minus one over N. So you subtract off the term that's gonna give you the one, and then you're left with showing that this other term is just bounded by one over N, essentially the leading order. And this is an easier, an easier problem. You can go back and forth because now you're, trying to preserve the leading term and not the, and is now the leading term and not the, so then it's every, okay. So yeah, right. 
So this, so this, so that's roughly, so this is much better. So you do, this is what you prove. So you just have to prove this. And now you can go back using the bound and, and you, you've got this. So, this. so the key to doing all this, what, what you have to do is you introduce this operator K and this is the conditional expectation of a function depending only on say the first variable given the second variable. So this is a self-adjoint operator on the L2 space where the measure is the single dimensional marginal of the sphere. And if you had exact independence, it would be a projection. Okay, and here's where it comes up and what we've just been talking about. This L, the exact, ex, what you have is the L2 norm of F squared is equal to the sum of these L2 norms of the pieces. And then the inner, what's left over are these inner products. Okay, now again, if you had exact independence, the K would be a projection onto the constants and this would just give you zero. So it turns out that the eigenfunctions of the K are these Jacobi polynomials, are Jacobi polynomials, and you can work out, it's a very explicit thing. And so this is the third reduction in the series, which, which gets you through to the end. Um, you first reduce from the real cat's generator to this conjugate process. Then to control that, things are better for large N because you have this approximate independence. It's expressed, at least for pairs, and it's expressed through this K operator and the spectrum of that, but you need to know quite a lot about the spectrum of this. Okay, but you can do this. Um, the good thing is it's kinematical. So when we did this three-dimensional hard sphere case, we were able to take advantage of all the estimates for the K operator that Michael Loss and Jeff Geronimo and I had done when we were working on the so-called Maxwellian case. It's, you know, they're, they're there and ready to use. Okay, so this is the bag of toolkits that go, things that go in with this. Okay, I think I've said as much as I want to say about that. I want to get a little bit of time on to, yes, I'm just good. Okay. So, it's a mystery here. And the mystery is if you look at spectral gaps, you get spectral gaps and you don't have to have any side conditions on the function. It's any L2 function on the state space, you get the spectral gap of the kind of thing that Katz conjectured. Now, when Katz made his conjecture, he even hedged on that because he realized that certain functions would not be relevant to the Katz dynamics, like things that have all of the energy concentrated in one particle. So he said there might need to be some side conditions on it, but this is not the case. You don't need side conditions. Now, with the entropy, you do need side conditions, except nobody knows what the inequalities are that have these side conditions on them. So we've tried various, various things um, and for the Fs, um, they're, they're, and you'd like to have these th such, you would like to have the side conditions be something that's propagated by the evolution. If you take away that restriction, then things are easier and you can write down some side conditions or you do get entry production. And this was done in a paper of myself and Ria Carvalho and Amit Ainev. Okay, so I'd now like to talk about a, a, a quantum class of models. And so it's the, the analog of these things. And if, if you're at least you're working in a finite dimensional state space, it won't be possible to have all the energy in one particles. And so one might expect better behavior here. Okay, so briefly I'll say, I'll just give the barest introduction because running out of time to what you'll find if you're interested in following this up. There's a paper on the archive and in, in advances in mathematics. Um, consider a quantum system of N particles with a single particle state space H and H sub N is the n-fold tensor product, okay? And you take Jth to know that J, H sub J is the Jth factor. If you've got an operator in the single particle space, if you give it a subscript like A1, it just means it operates on the first factor. AJ operates on the H factor. Now, let little h denote a single particle Hamiltonian, and then the n-particle Hamiltonian is the sum of these guys. Okay, so there's no interaction here. And this is like in the, you know, the Boltzmann equation, the energy is just the sum the sum of energies, the particles are not interacting between collisions. So all the interaction in the collisions and collisions, the particles are free. There's no energy. Okay, so that's, this is the analog of that. How are the collisions described? Okay, well, you have some space which parameterizes the types of collisions. This would be the circle in the previous thing. And there's a map there from unitaries. These are unitaries on H tensor H, the, the two particle space because we want a binary collision. So you pick up point sigma in this space C and then U of sigma can be regarded as a scattering matrix of some particular type of collision that the particles may undergo, okay? And so then U sigma rho U star sigma gives the state after the appropriate type of collision has happened, okay? So you've got all these possible collisions. You want these collisions to preserve energy. So this is the bottom line 
down, down here, okay? Um, this, we just promote them up so they act on, you know, UIJ operates on the IJ particles and so forth. You want them to preserve the energy, so you do that. This means that the full, once you've lifted the operators up in the obvious way, they preserve the end particle Hamiltonian, okay? So they commute with that. Okay, and now here are a bunch, let me just get rid of it. So we've got a, a family of these scattering matrices, uh, one for each type of collision. This is the amount of, um, think of it as representing the angle in this CATS model, whether it's a grazing collision, direct or whatever. So it has to commute with the energy. We want included in these, we want to have the identity. We want it to be continuous. So that would mean there'll be a bunch of grazing collisions, things that are almost continuous as, okay, as in the CATS model. And then we need some good properties that will give you time reversibility. So we want, if U is in the thing, we want U star to be in there, okay? And there's some properties that give you time reversal invariance. So then here's this basic operation. We had Q, Q is a standard thing for the collision kernel. So you take, Yay is uij of sigma and uij of sigma star, you conjugate it, and then you average over all the possible things. So this is like averaging oceans, okay, back in, in the classical CATS model. And now the CATS generator, okay, you, you write down this Q, you take the average over these things, one upon n choose two, and then the generator is n times this minus the identity. So why is the n there? Well, um, this means that, you know, and this time, each, each particle is going to have a, a I mean, the, the rate at which some particle collides will be, be of, of order one over n. So there are n particles, then each particle, the, the waiting time between, between collisions involving a, a, single, a single j is, is of order one. So that's the, the right thing for getting a, 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 a limiting equation out of the kind we want. Okay, so then you can solve this thing. So the, the, the Katz master equation is this d rho by dt equals ln of rho, and you get this quantum Markov semigroup. Okay, now what's done in this paper, and I'll just give this, what's done in the paper that we wrote on this, we investigated propagation of chaos for this equation. And propagation of chaos means you, a family of n particle density matrices would be chaotic if as n goes to infinity, the two particle marginals are tensor products of the single particle marginals for some row. And then you can again get a binary nonlinear evolution equation for the density matrix row. And so this is true. So the, this chaos is propagated by the evolution. If you have this property when you start, you have it later in the evolution. This is what Katz originally proved about the Katz models. We then investigated this nonlinear equation and all the steady states, okay? Now I'm talking about collisions here, but this is probably not really, I mean, this is not, for people who are doing a quantum Boltzmann equation, really thinking of colliding particles, you would like to do this in a setting with fermionic particles and then propagation of chaos is replaced. Process here, describe degradation of the steady states for, for this Katz master equation, as it's shown in the paper, they're all purely separable states. There's no entanglement whatsoever. So if you start out with an entangled state, then the time evolution of this thing, this under this Katz process, one loses the entanglement. And so entanglement is a resource in quantum information theory. And there's interest in understanding how entanglement gets degraded through these kinds of processes. So this is the real interest of uh, so, such as there is in these Katz master, quantum Katz master equations of this type has to do with questions of entanglement. And so this is and rings up interesting questions which are now under investigation. We've got the chaos and so forth. But instead of looking at entropy dissipation, we're interested in understanding how the entanglement um, goes to zero over time. And can one control the rate of this? This is a little harder because the nice thing about entropy is it's given by an explicit formula, which makes it easy to differentiate. And most of the things which give interesting expressions of entanglement um, involves solving some variational problem, and this makes it a bit harder, okay? But at least one has a good propagation of chaos. And if you're interested in spectral gaps, we have succeeded in proving a uniform spectral gap. So it's like the original Katz model, and it's, seems very likely because of the similarity of this evolution to depolarizing to the depolarizing channels that it's likely that one gets a um, uniform in time at least for finite dimensional systems a uniform in n entropy dissipation inequality but that's an open problem too
Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think at this point I'll, I'll stop for running close to the end of the time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for this uh, interesting presentation. Um, are there questions? So I, I, I think I will start. I mean, uh, you were making a, a comment uh, uh, right now about the quantum cuts um, uh, dynamics about uh, uh, something you would like to do with fermions, right? I mean, uh, uh, but there some other connection was bad and I lost your comment. So I just wanted to ask you to um, whether you could uh, uh, somehow come back on that again. Right, so for, for these systems um, where you have this propagation of chaos case where the two particle marginal, if the two particle marginal is uh, density, D is the product, the tensor product of the one particle marginal densities. I mean, that can't happen with fermions because the, the eigenfunctions would not be anti-symmetric. So in, in Fermi states, you cannot have chaos in this sense. The, the, the anti-symmetry puts in a different kind of correlations. And so people who are working to derive quantum, for instance, work of uh, um, Erdos and, and Yao, driving the linear quantum Boltzmann equation from the system of fermions, then one works on, one needs a different notion of chaos. So work, work is done with quasi-free states and so forth and propagation of quasi-free states. And so I, the, the, yeah, I, so although I was talking about collisions here, for this class of quantum Boltzmann models, we're not really talking about colliding particles in a gas. You would never hope, you would never try to use this to describe a system of colliding electrons because they would not have propagation of chaos in this sense. On the other hand, for a lot of systems of, in, of, of, of coupled quantum systems, such as rising quantum information theory, then this kind of dynamics is, is directly relevant and is studied. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but is there um, at least a heuristic derivation of uh, the quantum Boltzmann equation from the quantum Katz master dynamics? Huh? Oh, well, well, there is, you're right, there is a quantum Boltzmann equation, which you, once you've proved propagation of chaos, which we do in, in the paper, then, you know, the, then replace, so the, the derivation of the, sorry, the time derivative of the single particle margin can be expressed in terms of two, because it's a binary, and once you stick in the chaos assumption, play two particle margin, the then you indeed get a nonlinear evolution equation for the single particle marginal with a binary, with binary, um, sorry, a quadratic nonlinearity. And so, yes, so, so more than heuristic, you can actually prove, prove a theorem, which is that in the large end limit, the single particle marginals of densities evolving under this quantum Katz master equation will, will satisfy a quantum Boltzmann type equation. Mm -hmm. But the nonlinearity is quadratic for this quantum Boltzmann equation. Correct. Mm -hmm. Well, as it is for the usual, like, yeah, well, yes, for this one, it's quadratic and it's in the density matrix. So it's a little different if you look at the, right, so it's again a different problem. If you're looking really at electrons and you'd have this uhling uhlenbeck type mm -hmm. equation, right? and then you'd have these factors of one minus F times one minus, so it's quartic because you put in these things to take into account the Pauli exclusion principle. So you have factors of one plus or one minus F that are thrown in the usual quadratic term. Okay, okay, thank you very much. But this is done with Boltzmann, but this is with Boltzmann statistics, so it doesn't it doesn't show up in there. Yeah, I see. Yeah, thanks. Well, um, again, I just want to emphasize we're talking about this in terms of coll colliding particles. We really aren't trying to talk about colliding electrons. That's a different story. Yeah. Uh, other questions or comments? Uh, may I ask a question? Uh, uh, this quantum uh, quantum cuts. Uh, Dynamics uh, uh, was it uh, completely po a completely positive uh, semigroup? Oh yes, I should have. Used a good, very good point. I should have said that. Right, you you see that it's given. Um, I think there's a formula for it. Yeah, here here it is, right over here. So each of these QNs, of course, that that's those are given in terms of conjugation by unitaries. So the, these are a bunch of averages over conjugations by unitaries. Each of the QNs that's completely positive. So so yes, it's a it's a completely positive. Yeah, uh, so Mark this, semi group. The, the, this uh, cl classical Katz mm -hmm. uh, uh, master equation. I mean, behind that uh, there was uh, a, a spherical symmetry. I, I, I actually, a very uh, a huge. Uh, uh, I mean, it it uh, it happened on a huge uh, sphere. Now, 
in this quantum case, you you just have permutation symmetry, or or do I miss something? Well, the, the thing that plays the role of the sphere, of course, the, the sphere. So so there's some energy shells here. So when we study this propagation case, we also restrict we restrict things to to the to um. Yeah. So if, so if you take if you take this little h, there's, there's, there's going to be a big degeneracy of the eigenstates of the n particle Hamiltonian, and and these collisions all conserve energy. So if you start out with a state that has well, if you start out with a state that has energies in some shell of, of spectrum in some shell of the energy the n particle energy, it stays there. Oh, the, the, so, so the sphere. So the thing that plays the role of the spheres are these are these inner spectral spectral subspaces of the n particle Hamiltonian. Oh, okay, does it satisfy the, the, the so-called detailed balance condition? Yes, right. So I, I flipped by some screen about having when you so yeah that, so that that was why it was important to have in this collection of unitaries that you're conjugating by the 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 inverse should also be in there somewhere and it, the measure that uh, we, the measure within which it comes in is is related to the measure which the un inverse part or the conjugate doesn't comes in. Thank you. So this, yeah, this is cooked up. So there's this complicated thing that went by. I mean, there are these conditions here, like in the middle of the page, that you know this. So so this thing, I mean, right? Doing reversing the time means doing the uh, taking the conjugation of these unitaries, and so then you need to know that these are related to each other in some nice way. So it, it's cooked up so that it's it's a real it's a right. So this is exactly within the class of this current work. This is exactly within the class of. So, uh, can, can one just can be in terms of great, great rev Oh, sorry, the connection is bad. Yeah. Well, uh, can, can one uh, describe a, a stationary state for this quantum cuts uh, equation? So, I mean, Yes, so th that's done. That's the other thing that's done in, in great detail on questions of ergodicity in, in the paper. And so what, what you go to is, as you would expect from the, so if you, if you start out with this, so let me describe this case. If you start out with the state of density matrix, which is built out of eigenfunctions that have the same eigenvalue for the n particle Hamiltonian, what you will converge to is the normalized projection onto that eigenvalue for the n particle Hamiltonian. Yeah, so, so, this uh, projection has to be finite dimensional. So the... right, right, right. The projection has to be finite dimensional. That, that this doesn't mean your little h's have to be finite dimensional. You need to just know yeah. that the, for instance, that the resolvent of the single particle Hamiltonian is compact for some. Thank you. Right. That, that will mean that the individual eigenspaces of the single particle Hamiltonian are finite dimensional. And other questions? Yeah, I have a question about uh, your last comments on quantum cast model. You said you can get a uniform spectrum gap. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that uh, in your paper or is new results? Uh, it's uh, n neither. Um, the, the, the paper was getting rather long and we think we have a likely to have a also the uh, the entropy bound so we didn't put that in the paper that's there but it's but we we we've written it all out carefully so that's a true fact okay but, um i do believe we will, i and this is not uh, something i can call a true fact yet um i do believe that the methods that i was doing with jan moss for example will uh yield an uniform and bound entropy production inequality for it Oh, really? That's impressive. It's even a stronger result. But so if we get that one, then we'll put it all together in, in one, one paper. But you mean uniform in terms of N once you fix uniform this? Uniform in terms of N, right. Compact mm -hmm. collision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Other questions or comments? Okay, so if not, uh, I think we can thank uh, Eric again for the inspiring presentation. And um, thank you, Eric. Okay, well, thank you very much.